Jane Espenson described the dance scene in Shindig as Jane Austen-like talking while dancing. The episode contains a handful of duels, not just the obvious one at the climax, but until I heard her say that in the episode's commentary, I had never really thought about how well the act of dance worked as a metaphor for sizing up and considering a partner. There are many layers like that to Shindig, one of my favorites in Firefly. It's an episode that could be read as a treatise on class and gender, with layers of subversive roleplay unfolding in each of its scenes, but from any perspective, it is a joy. Firefly are doing some business with unrulies over a game of hollow pool when the table has some troubles. Inara has come along to watch. Mal finds out the men they're dealing with are slavers and decides to rob one of them. Way. Good drinker, that one. Before escorting Inara out of the bar. The crew is making a stop at Persephone, the same planet we were on in the episode Serenity. Wash and Zoe look on in awe, and I feel like Firefly CG is aging extremely well, and one of the keys is the lighting. This shot is beautiful. Inara is screening clientele to find her own job on Persephone. I'm not sure where Espenson got the transcript of how I asked out my first girlfriend. And the honor you do me flatters my... My honor. Inara gets an incoming from Atherton Wing, who is a little more gooder with the word thing parts. Now there's the smile made of sunlight. Mal comes in to engage Inara for a bout of debasement fencing. He has engaged me for several days. Days? Boy must have stamina. He does. As always, I love the way Inara parries and uses Mal's momentum against him. On Persephone, the crew are hunting for their job when they stop to stare at some finery in a women's clothing store. If I'm gonna wear a dress, I want something with some slink. You want a slinky dress? I can buy you a slinky dress. Captain, can I have money for a <laughs> slinky dress? <sighs> Wash and Zoe are possibly one of my most favorite couples in all of television. The ways in which they feel so rich, detailed, and individually different from each other, yet fit together so well is wonderful. And I I can't include the crew's entire exchange in front of the store window, but nearly every line is worth a mention. Kaylee fantasizes about getting a chance to live like Anara through the dress. The mention of Anara triggers Mal, and he makes a crass joke that only Jane, Mal's metaphorical masculinity run amok, finds amusing. Is she mad or something? Anytime Jane agrees with Mal, he knows he's probably screwed something up. Badger politely asks for a chat at gunpoint, and at the chat, Jane puts three cubes of sugar in his wood grain tea and gorges on finger sandwiches. Those finger sandwiches. As ever in a boss hat. Badger wants to connect Mal to a man trying to move black market goods, and is going to get Mal into an exclusive ball to meet him. Of course, you can buy an invite with a diamond the size of a testicle. I got my hands on a couple. Mal and Jane smirk at the testicle joke, as if to emphasize their metaphorical relationship I just mentioned. They take the job, and the evening of the ball occurs. Inara makes the rounds on Atherton's arm, using a professional polish, which is immediately contrasted against the crass way Atherton addresses her. Half the men in this room wish you were on their arm tonight. All of them wish they were in your bed. Atherton follows up the slight by asking Anara to move to Persephone to be his live-in companion, and then follows up the world's worst job pitch by calling her home. What? A piece of Gosa? But it is a piece of Gosa. He's trying to use the Mandarin term go she, which means dog crap, but I think it's amusing the way he pronounces it actually sounds more like the Korean term that means superior or exceptional. There's an interesting parallel here, too, between the way both Mal and Anara do business. Remember Mal with the Alliance officer in the previous episode, never answering a question? No children on this book. I didn't say children. I misunderstood. Anara uses a similar tactic of deflection. You're generous, man. That is not a yes. It's not a no, either. To his credit, Mal tries to make up for his earlier Jane move by buying Kaylee the dress she wanted. Arguably, he needed her help to get in, so it may feel a little less amenzy, but he could have taken Zoe. As ever, Mal is complex. His Jane-ness-ness may emerge from time to time, but he does try and own it. Kaylee gets distracted by a giant bowl of strawberries, the use of which works as a great storytelling callback to show the decadence of the event. If books tiny box box of fresh strawberries was enough of a commodity to help buy his passage on board Serenity, imagine the value of that bowl. Kaylee finds an adorable way of excusing herself. Is that him? That's the buffet table. 
Well, how can we be sure? Unless we question it. Back on the ship, part of the crew are gambling away their chores when River goes hog wild with some labels on the canned food. We'll have a few mystery meals. Kaylee runs into some mean girls, but finds a comfortable place to chat with the men at the party. Atherton takes issue with Anara's dance with Mal, and Mal makes an interesting distinction. She's mine. Yours. I should belong to nobody. This ties back to Mal's similar revulsion with the slavers in the episode's opening. Mal, who fought against the Alliance's possession of his planet, takes issue with Anara's position on the basis of how he perceives it limits her freedom, despite the fact that Anara's job is both her choice and the thing that actually empowers her freedom. More on that in a bit. But rather than saying how he feels for Anara, as ever he speaks with his actions and decks Atherton, accidentally activating dual rules that exist on Persephone. Turns out this is my kind of party. Badger keeps the rest of the crew from saving Mal. Anara tries to get Mal to run, and he refuses. And I never back down from a fight. Yes, you do. You do all the time. Well, yeah. Short of getting him to leave, she gives him a fencing instruction in a scene that echoes their duel of words from the opening. Days. Boy must have stamina. He does. <laughs> Badger takes a special interest in River before something odd happens. You got a secret? No, I'm sure. Uh... I got a secret. I mentioned that River might be read as Mal's metaphorical potential, and in an episode forcing him to reach for new levels of classy, River discovers new depths by Britishing back at Badger. Cockney River seems to be unusually perceptive about Badger's past. Spent some time in the lockdown, but less than a climb. At the duel the next day, Mal gets his tight pants ass kicked until Anara offers a quick distraction. Atherton, wait! <coughs> Mal then lets Atherton live with grace and dignity. Oh. Well, I'm alright. Mal wins the contract Badger wanted, and the episode ends with Anara and him conversating over the goods in question. One of the marvels of Firefly as a series is that every single episode of its run is so strong. In typical mutant enemy fashion, almost all of them contain at least an iconic moment that when people reflect on the show pops into their minds. From the interrogation sequence in Bushwhacked, definitely have to say it was her legs, to something as simple as Jane's, time for some thrilling heroics, in the train job. But Shindig is the first of a handful of episodes from the show that feel as close to perfect as the series gets. As been take on Jane Austen meets Future Space Cowboy is just so charming, whimsical, and tightly scripted. From the cute pun in the cold open, this whole episode is, after all, about a ball failure, to the exploration of class and gender elegantly done with a wink and a nod throughout, Shindy is just so darn, well, shiny, damn it. But rather than feeling overburdened by theme or plot, we still get a bunch of moments that are driven by and reveal these characters that I was at this point in the series already in love with. One of the constants that comes up whenever people talk about Firefly is the chemistry, and there is a lot of it here. Jewel State and Adam Baldwin have both said that their characters had a brother-sister dynamic, but in this episode, I think we see Kaylee kind of had two older brothers in Mal and Jane. Non-romantic love relationships between between characters that have no reason not to hook up feels so refreshing compared to the norm. Though, of course, was this partially due to Firefly's short run? Would we have gotten to a point where someone eventually asks, has anyone on this ship not slept together? In the video for Bushwhacked, I talked about how places in the Firefly universe exist on a spectrum between freedom and structure. An abundance of freedom devoid of any structure leads to the Reavers, and too much structure without freedom leads to the Alliance. That spectrum exists within Shindig as well, from the barroom brawl in the opening around Mal's people to the duel at the end around Nara's. And the episode says that while there can be violence at both ends of that spectrum, it follows that rigid or more developed gender roles would exist more on the structured side of that spectrum than the other. The primary symbol the episode uses for its thematic exploration occurs during the game of Tall Card, a real card game Espenson made up, between Jane, Book, and Simon. River wanders into the kitchen, and in the shooting script for the episode, her original first line as she looked at the cans was, there it is, there it is. It's always there if you look for it. Everybody sees, and nobody sees it. After which, she starts removing the labels from the cans. Once Simon has put River's attention at ease, Book holds up the cans, now externally all the same, and says, We'll have a few mystery meals. There is also a repetition of the
the term pretentious. First used in reference to how Mal is in his world, and second used in how Inara might be in hers. I'd be his personal companion. I could belong here. Call me pretentious, but there is some appeal in that. Pretentious meaning attempting to impress by affecting greater importance, talent, culture than is actually possessed. Returning to the cans, in basic terms, a label that says anything other than what the contents of the can are could be termed pretentious. Changing or ornamenting the label on the can doesn't change its contents, and the labels River Removes function as a symbol for what virtually every character in this one is exploring, mostly through their use of costume. From the very beginning, Espenson also plays with gender roles and expectations as a subset of the exploration of class. At one end of the class spectrum is Mal, starting a fistfight with men peddling slaves over a game of pool, and at the other end are the mean girls, helped into their dress by those very slaves. Pool is a genderfied game, if ever there was one, what with the stick, balls, and pockets. Anara even comments on how Jane, Mal's metaphorical masculinity, is always suspiciously skillful with these kinds of things. The key seems to be giving Jane a heavy stick and standing back. Kaylee, who spends her life in a principally male-dominated blue-collar position, wants to feel feminine and beautiful, with Mal throwing the contrast of those two things in her face. We've previously seen her lustfully consume a strawberry, and in the opening of this episode, Inara is wearing a red top with black dots that make her look a little strawberry-like. Kaylee perceives in Inara a type of freedom she doesn't have. Inara gets to wear whatever she wants. And thinks she's gaining some access to that experience by changing her label with the dress she covets through the window. But where Inara's outfit is a deep adult red, Kaylee's dress is more an adolescent pink. Similarly, Kaylee dress is a big hopey number, with Inara's dress at the ball being a partially form-fitting bodice, indicating her greater level of comfort and self-assuredness. Kaylee has a duel of her own with the mean girls who expose her label change. A man steps in to save her, mirroring the duel Mal has with Atherton when Inara steps in to help him. Later in the sequence, Kaylee appears to have settled into her own skin, just being herself and talking engines, but notice that she is surrounded by only men. Again, in keeping with the range established in Bushwhacked, a more aristocratic society feels more patriarchal and less free. Things are far more fluid on Serenity. Yes, Jane and Inara could be read as the ultimate representations of masculine and feminine, but everyone else moves around somewhere in between. For example, as Mal's second-in-command, Zoe is tough as nails and occupies what might be considered a traditionally male-dominated position. <laughs> But she expresses the same interest in femininity. If I'm gonna wear a dress, I want something with some slink. You want a slinky dress? I can buy you a slinky dress. Captain, can I have money for a <laughs> slinky dress? While still not putting up with even a moment of Jane's sass. I'll chip in. I can hurt you. And we get to see her in an unusual position with Wash. Sexy, vulnerable, label fully removed. But even in this moment, Zoe is a subversion of our standard expectations of gender roles. The first one to start falling asleep after sex. <sighs> Don't fall asleep now. Sleepiness is weakness of character, ask anyone. And Wash's line in this scene highlights the episode's label play again. I like our party better. The dress code's easier, and I know all the steps. The costume designer for Firefly, Shauna Tripsick, also uses Inara's dress to separate her from the rest of the attendees at the ball. Around Inara are patterns in multiple colors, but her hair, dress, and makeup are very Grecian statuesque, making her look like she doesn't belong. But keeping with the label metaphor again, Atherton comments on the irrelevance of Inara's when he tells Mal, Money changed hands, which makes her mind tonight. No matter how you dress her up, she's still... And the label idea repeats again, when, after having his own metaphorical one partially removed by a swordsy Mal, Atherton's true inner content is revealed. I should have uglied you up so no one else would want you. Mal is no different, as his clothing has also already been torn up, and he shows his true inner nature. Oh. Oh. Guess I'm just a good man. Oh. Well, I'm all right. The episode sets up a false choice for Anara between Mal and Atherton Wing, who, at least on the surface, bears a few of Mal's characteristics. Mal can be a manipulative wordsmith, and when we first meet Atherton, he shows the same aptitude when he is immediately contrasted against my teenage doppelganger. Now there's the smile made of sunlight. And Mal sees Atherton as pretentious, the same way that Badger sees Mal. Exactly. You think you're better than other people. 
Atherton Wing is Espen's inversion of a Jane Austen W. Either George Wickham from Pride and Prejudice or John Willoughby from Sense and Sensibility. The False Love. Mal falls neatly into the role of Mr. Darcy in this one. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. In declaring myself thus, I am fully aware that I will be going expressly against the wishes of my family, my friends, and I hardly need add my own better judgment. And Atherton is actually the name of a small city in California that is regularly ranked as one of the most expensive zip codes in the United States. The name is an old Anglo-Saxon term for settlement, which is sort of what Atherton is trying to do to Inara, lay claim, fix his flag, so to speak. Atherton feigns respect for Inara and her profession, while barely hiding his sense that that profession makes her his property. Mal scorns Inara for her profession openly, including in front of company, but we can feel an our hearts that Mal is different from Atherton. I just think the reason why is a little more difficult to pin down than it might seem at first glance. The thing that Mal never owns is that, unlike a slave, Anara's profession is Anara's choice. Ultimately, the arc of every character on Firefly relates to the idea of freedom whether it's the Tams, Kaylee, Anara, or even Mal. And ignoring Mal's rationalizations and equivocating, My work's illegal, but at least it's honest. What? Everyone's freedom comes with a cost. Freeing River costs Simon his status, and keeping that freedom requires an alliance with Mal. Jane trades submission to Mal for the money, and the freedom that that money allows him because right now, no one else has made Jane a better offer. How come you didn't turn on me, Jane? Money wasn't good enough. Kaylee's knowledge of engineering grants her hers, but we see in this episode that it can at times cost her something she desires. Mal's life is nothing but compromise for the sake of his own freedom, as he makes deals with the crows, the niskas, and the patiences of the verse, while constantly trying to keep his own honor in balance. In some ways, the power and freedom Anara's position grants her makes her the most powerful and free of any of Serenity's crew, because it gives her access to the companion registry. We can see the fear that this inspires in Atherton's eyes at the end of the episode. That's not how it works. You see, you've earned yourself a black mark in the client registry. No companion is going to contract with you ever again. As much as Mal would like to compare what Anara does to slavery and react to it the way he did the slavers in the opening, in this episode we see that Anara's honor not only doesn't need defending, but is persistently tormenting her for her career is in fact another way in which he is like Atherton, who wants Anara to give up the thing that gives her power and freedom in order to be his full-time mistress. I'm trying to offer you something, you know. A life if you want it. Dudes, she has a life. Leave her the hell alone. But Mal's hypocrisy is also galling. In this episode, Mal tells Kaylee he bought her the dress and brought her to the ball to make him look respectable, and that is exactly the same role for him that Anara fulfills on the ship. Mal criticizes Anara endlessly for her position while seeing fit to take advantage of the opportunities that it presents him with. For all these reasons, Mal's attempts to defend his terrible behavior in this episode feel deeply hollow and inadequate. I might not show respect to your job, but he didn't respect you. That's the difference. But, again, we know Mal is a better man than Atherton, and I think the difference is in their final scene together. Mercy is the mark of a great man. Guess I'm just a good man. In both the way Mal hilariously pincushions Atherton and finally speaks with some humbleness to Anara in the final scene. As I look back, probably should have stayed out of your world. Mal, like any of his crew members, is a work in progress, and importantly, is aware that he is. And when he's made to see the error of his ways, he tries to correct. Son of a bitch. And to make amends. His transgressions may be frustrating, but with his attitude in their final scene together, cheersing over a Carlo Rossi jug of engine Sauvignon, we feel a certain sense. It's enough. Anara's final line throws some of the conceits of the episode into question, the opening scene being her not fitting into Mal's world and the rest being Mal not fitting into hers. My world. 
if it is that. Inara always seemed as though she was floating on a plane just outside of everyone at the ball on Persephone. Likewise, Badger and Jane were both right. Mal does seem like he's slumming a bit when he's dealing with the criminal types, however he chooses to rationalize it. In an episode about labels and class and gender and pretense, here in the final scene inside of this floating space can, the episode ends in the only place that both Inara and Mal actually fit. With each other. On Serenity. Home.